everyone, welcome. My name is Lauren. I'm a homeschooling mom of three girls. And today I'm gonna to share how we do a lesson from the Good and the Beautiful Science. We are doing the unit of ecosystems. So I'm gonna share what a typical unit and a typical science lesson looks like for us. So here is my binder of all of the lessons for the ecosystems unit. This one is a little bit shorter. It is only nine lessons. So what I do is I put one lesson on each in each pocket and then I pull the lessons, I pull the folder out for that week and I just use whatever lessons are in that. And that way it's a little bit more manageable and less overwhelming for me personally and I have found that it's worked really well for us. So this unit we're on, we just finished lesson seven. We're about halfway through unit eight. So I'm gonna pull this one out now. I'm sorry, lesson eight. Um, so we're gonna finish lesson eight today. And then the last one that we have is lesson nine. We will finish that end of this week, beginning of next week. Also, my girls each have a binder and in each of their binder, we are doing four units this year. And each unit has, um, I put some paper and I put all of the, uh, the handouts and activity pages that they're doing in a notebook for each session. So we did um, space already, we did arthropods, we are currently finishing up ecosystems, and then our last one will be all about mammals. So it's all together. So I say get your science binder and they each have one. And then I purchased the picture book pack that came with this. This is um, Elf Owl and his ecosystem and ecosystems in our backyard. We've read this one already. It's three different ecosystems throughout the world. So it starts in Australia and then in Maryland. And then the last one is um, in Hong Kong. So it just shows how there's different ecosystems. This one is a city in Hong Kong and how it's there's a little ecosystem just on their balcony. So that one was fun to see that. We haven't read this one yet. I'll probably start reading this one tomorrow before we finish up the unit. But uh, this one looks really, really pretty. I just love the illustrations that they put with their books. Um, and then lastly, we have this uh, Us Born, The Great Animal Search. This is just different ecosystems. It's not related, but here's like the Arctic, under the sea, and that way, this is just something fun. They're supposed to find these different animals in the book. So we, um, my girls like doing this one too. So there's all different types in here. So I'm pulling this out. Like I said, I only do half a lesson at a time just because that is all that we have the time and attention span for right now in our homeschool is just half a lesson. So um, we're learning about biomes right now, freshwater biomes and marine biomes, so water biomes. So we're finishing that up today and they're gonna make a little binder, a little booklet. And it all comes, if in case you're feeling like that sounds a little bit overwhelming, it comes with everything you need as far as um, the handouts and things like that. So you're not having to like, you know, you're not on your own. They definitely provide everything that you need and guide you step by step along the way. So we started the first two um, pages of this yesterday. So we'll finish up the last bit of it today and then put it together. So you'll be able to see what the finished product looks like. But here is an example of some of the, like here where we learned about terrestrial biomes. So they had to uh, cut out the pictures and glue them to the one that they belonged with. Uh, this one was really fun. This was cute. This was an energy pyramid. The levels of ecology organization. So this is how it breaks down. It starts with an individual organism, goes to a population, all the way up to the biosphere, which is obviously Earth. They had to organize silverware, um, and that just shows kind of how like an ecosystem works, and it just kind of brings it to their level. So silverware is an individual, and then the population is all this, all the spoons. I'm sorry. And then the community is like forks, knives, and spoons. The ecosystem is the kitchen. The biome is the home and the biosphere is the neighborhood. So it brings it to their level. And then they make their own little things as well. Um, so there's a combination of them having to write in their journals and then activities that they do. All the activities have been pretty straight and simple, straightforward for the most part. We're gonna finish up with our last bit today, which is finishing the um, the aquatic biomes booklet. 
So here we have lesson eight. Again, we started this the other day. So you're supposed to cut out the marine biome and fresh biome photographs. I have already done that. I prepped this at the in the summer actually, and it was much, much easier to have everything prepped all at once, all the units at once. Um, and then we had the, the copy of the aquatic biomes booklet, which I just showed you. They had each of those, um, they each had a copy of that in their own science binders. So here's the activity supply. So um, just glass jars, salt, plastic plate, a sponge. Now they need grass seed in an empty container. I think it's because they're going to watch their own biome grow. I was reading ahead to what that was. So since I did the first two pages of this um, the other day, it takes about 20 minutes for us to do half of a lesson. So keep that in mind. These lessons are not sim like super quick. If you do the whole lesson, it's going to take a while. They say um, about 45 minutes to an hour and that is absolutely right. I'm going to read about still water biomes today and then they'll do the corresponding page in that activity book. Moving water biomes, wetlands, fresh water biomes, read all of that and then that will they will be once I have read all of this they will have done the corresponding activities in their um, activity booklet and then they will be finished with that and we will be done the last so the last part of the lesson is the wetlands activity this is where they each have a sponge and then they're supposed to have um, I think some grass seeds and the grass is going to grow out of the sponge and I honestly don't think I have grass seeds. I, we might skip this activity. We have, I, we honestly have not skipped most. We've done almost all of the activities. This one we may skip though, just cause I simply do not have grass seeds. Um, and then lastly is this grades seven to eight extension. This does not have to be just for seventh and eighth graders. Um, if you have a fifth, sixth grader who's interested in, in reading this, they can, but this is just to make it a little bit um, give them a little bit more work and make it a little bit deeper. And uh, so you do not, this is not part of the lesson otherwise, unless you want to assign this to your seventh grader, eighth grader, or even maybe a sixth grader. Lola is in kindergarten. She does participate the best that she can, but um, this is mostly for Larissa in fourth grade and Lexi who is in second grade. They definitely get more out of it, but Lola does still participate. And still water biomes. Lily pads can be found in many ponds. Frogs and toads can be found in or near lakes. More animals are found there than in a lake or pond. Most fish that live in rivers always swim upstream. Plants and animals vary between each river and stream. The second longest river? Yeah. All right, and then lastly is the wetlands, okay? The wetlands are crane, where cranes, bitterns, egrets, and plovers search for insects with their specially adapted beaks. Red-winged blackbirds shriek among the cattails. Tall grasses, reeds, and rushes often grow at the edge of the lakes or in wetlands. Pitcher plants, which hold a slippery cup of liquid for insects to live in, are found in wetlands. Alligators, snakes, and raccoons all live in wetlands. The Florida Everglades is the largest wetland biome in the USA. So when you think of wetland biomes, biomes, have you thought of the Florida Everglades? Do you guys know what the Everglades are? Yeah. And then all freshwater biomes. Insects such as caterpillars, flies, dragons, beetles, and bugs creep and crawl in and around all types of freshwater biomes, okay? Some wetland biomes contain a mixture of salt water and fresh water called a brackish, called brackish water. Have you ever heard of brackish water before? No, I don't think I have either. But we will discuss them later. Actually, I think turtles would go in pumps. Water. Uh -huh. What is it? <laughs> um, pitcher plants. Um, I need to cut this down. Where? Where should I put pitcher plants? Why do you have electrical tape on your finger? Because. But don't, it's gonna cut off your circulation. Don't do that. It's gonna cut off. Well, that's. Don't put reassuring. tape on your fingers. Well, that's reassuring. I just read about marshes, bogs, and swamps. And so now they are going to look at the picture and determine from what I read, which one of these is a marsh, which one is a bog, and which one is a swamp. So that'll be page four of the mini book. Mm. Okay, so a marsh is a shallow water biome where grassy reeds grow. A bog is found in cooler climates and is dominated by the peat moss plant, 
which grows only a few inches above the ground. And then a swamp is covered by water all year long and is a forested wetland. So based on what I said, which one looks like it's a forested wetland that is covered by water? Yeah, uh, so I think this one is the swamp. That one makes sense. So let's do process of elimination. That one is the most obvious. Bog is surrounded by peat moss, which only grows a few inches above the ground. So which one looks like peat moss that only grows a few inches above the ground? This that one? one? Uh, this one? Yep. So marshes? Yep, so it looks like by process of elimination, this one must be a marsh. Does it sound right? It's shallow water where grassy reeds grow. Does that look like shallow water with grassy right. reeds? This yep. is the bog. Grassy reeds. This is the bog. Yeah, that's which one I said. Mm. So now we're going to turn to page five and six in the booklet, and then I'm going to read the facts on page six for the ocean, the coral reef, and the estuaries, and whichever one they find most interesting, they're going to cut out and put that fact underneath the corresponding mm. um, marine biome. Which one are you reading? Um, ocean and coral reef. Okay, go ahead. Because of the salt content of the ocean, the freezing temperature is lower than fresh water, so it rarely freezes. Coral reefs are made of coral polyps. 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 Polyps, yep. And then read the last one about estuaries. Mm. Estuaries can also be called bays, inlets, or la lagoons. Because of the depth and lack of oxygen, the, mo the ocean has gone unexplored. Visiting some parts of the ocean is like visiting the moon. More, most cor coral grow very slowly and take, and take hundreds of years to form. Some coral reefs have been around for thousands of years. So we're going to continue to read the rest of these and then like I said whichever one they find the most interesting they're going to cut out and paste on their page. Can you not decide which one? So the final book is a little cover page. We learned about freshwater biomes, water biomes, plants and animals, types of wetlands, marine biomes. And then lastly, she was able to color our marine biome plant and animal. I do want to say um, it has probably been the most advanced of the three units so far. It's definitely quite above my kindergartner's head. She's interested a little bit, but definitely not as much as like the space and the arthropods unit. So keep that in mind. If you have little ones who maybe are like second grade and below, you might want to save this unit for when they're a little bit older. My oldest is in fourth grade, so she is getting it. And my second grader grasps the concepts pretty well but again this I feel like is kind of advanced um, for for the units that I have we have done so far I think it's still a great unit it's definitely a shorter unit so that's kind of I think a plus because it is seems a little bit more advanced it's not like going to be dragging on but I also think it's really good because it lays a good foundation for like what any animal study that you're going to be doing like I said we're going to be studying mammals next which is one of the larger units and we just had studied arthropods and I know the good and the beautiful has many different animal units you know birds and reptiles and things like that so I do think that it is good to have kind of like as a base and a foundation so it kind of gives them an idea of habitats and ecosystems and things like that also I have to say that we only do half a lesson at a time we cannot do a full, I mean we have like maybe one time done a full lesson and they recommend 45 to 60 minutes for a lesson and that is not an overestimation that is definitely at least how long a lesson will take if you do everything so I just know my crew I know we're not going to be good with that um, but I don't think that it was a deterring factor that 
made me say, well, I'm just not gonna use this. So what I do is I split a lesson in half. And if you feel like your kids would be good around that 20 to 30 minute mark for a lesson rather than almost an hour, maybe you might wanna consider that because I know it's just been super helpful. We only take half a lesson at a time and then that makes it definitely more manageable. Now we do do lessons instead of twice a week, which the Good and the Beautiful recommends. We do it three to maybe four times a week um, in that range, definitely not all five days, but we do a more often, but just shorter chunks of time. And I feel like that has been extremely beneficial in their retention and their engagement and their, um, enthusiasm to continue to do it rather than feeling like it's this big, long, hour long session that they have to sit through. If you want to see more of an in-depth of how I put the binders together for the year, I will link that below because it has been amazing. Not that I'm, I'm amazing. I don't want to, that's not it, but I just know myself and I know come January and February, I have little to no motivation at all to do any kind of prep. So if it's not done for me, we just wouldn't have done science. I just know myself. So I did all the work up front this summer and, um, all four units were prepped at the beginning of the year and that's only because I know that I kind of run out of steam in this January and February time. So if you want to watch that video of how I did that and prepped everything for the year and how I did our science binders, I will link that below. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate you being here. If you would like to stick around for more of this type of homeschool content, please make sure you subscribe to my channel. Also, if you found this video to be helpful, hit the little like button right there. It helps my channel immensely. And it shows me that you appreciate this type of video and this type of content. Thanks again so much. I hope you have the best day. And until next time, see you later.